Does anyone know what a soft opening is? Uh, a soft opening is a dry run. It's intended to, you know, check the microphones and to work out all the glitches so that there are no problems later on. Uh, this is your soft opening. Uh, uh, this, for good or for ill, is the soft opening of TEDx Co uh, Creative Coast, uh, Savannah for 2012. My friend Dick Dever, uh, who was my best friend in my seminary days, uh, he's a fine human being. He was living abroad uh, when his first child was born, which was not too long before our first child was born. Dick was living in Vienna, and we had corresponded in those days when you still wrote letters. I wrote Dick, and I asked him in a letter, what was the most surprising thing about parenthood? Uh, he wrote back fairly quickly. It took about a week or 10 days, of course, in those days. But he wrote back rather quickly, and he said four words. The most surprising thing about parenthood is the constancy of it. Uh, it, it took me a while to understand exactly what he meant by that, but I, I did get it sooner rather than later. Uh, but the older I get, the more conscious I am of the fact that that constancy isn't limited to parenthood. Uh, it is the truth about life. Uh, after that, I developed a tagline to my own letters as I wrote them. Uh, instead of sincerely or love at the bottom of the letter, I would always write, Life continues unabated. Uh, and there's a corollary to that, by the way, in case you were wondering, and that is time flies whether you're having fun or not. <laughs> uh, life is what we do. Uh, life is what we do and how we do it. And of course, it is not just that. Life is also where we do it. The context of our lives in the community is important, even critically important. The place we live is essential, not only to our well-being, of course, but also to our creativity, to our ability and our desire to be creative people. The place we live is where relationships bloom, and intimacy born of those relationships is what feeds our creative purpose. Where I do what I do is what I want to talk about in these few minutes, and that is here. I live and work on Telfair Square. I live here, and by that I mean right out there, just outside these doors. Uh, I am in Telfair Square every day, even if it's only long enough to scoop dog dung. And, and for the record, I do that every time. Uh, <laughs> or to watch as our rescue Aussie uh, Louise uh, romps and plays. We live here. Our neighbors are some of you and all of those who traverse the square with any regularity at all. Mr. Hayward, Thomas and Kathleen at Roly Poly, Ellie and Carol and Joe and Larry and Beth at the Corps of Engineers, Janet uh, and John here at the Jepson Center, Laura and Nancy at the Telfair, Virginia and her dogs, and John and Brutus. That, that lovely woman with the amazing hair, you know who I'm talking about if you've ever been in the post office over here, amazing hair. Uh, and our good and generous with their parking lot friends at Oliver Manor. All of us in varying degrees, working to make this little corner or these four corners of Telfair Square a special, creative, warm and caring place to live. Uh, Kevin will be speaking shortly and uh, I'm sure he's going to tell you why that is so, uh, but my wife and I simply know it is true because we get to live into that truth each and every day. Anne and I raised two boys uh, on Telfair Square and we are on our second dog. We've spent many hours out in that public space throwing frisbees to each other and occasionally into uh, a young couple trying to enjoy a quiet afternoon. We've played touch football out there and half rubber and tried in vain to learn how to ease a curveball across the inside corner with an ancient live oak tree as a backstop. 
We've broken bread out there. We've broken bread out there as a family, and we've broken bread with the homeless. We've had ill-tempered encounters with the authorities more than once. We've inspired neighborhood artists. We've provided directions and restaurant recommendations. And we've apologized countless times for the city's parking problems. Uh, I mentioned two dogs. Uh, the first was Rosie, a uh, Springer Spaniel. Uh, she helped to raise our boys, first in a quiet suburban neighborhood in Knoxville, Tennessee, and later in a fourth floor loft apartment here on the square. Uh, truth be known, Rosie had the hardest time making the transition from a neighborhood in Knoxville to Savannah. In her last days, uh, she had trouble walking. And once when the power was out for about 18 hours following a storm, I carried her four flights of stairs three times down to the street. If you've ever owned a dog, you know that that was the very least I could do. Another time, another time, we neglected to turn the key on our lockable elevator. Uh, a bridesmaid with four other bridesmaids and a bride uh, in her bridal gown had inadvertently pressed the fourth floor button. Uh, when the door opened on our level, Rosie dutifully climbed aboard. We heard the screams fade as the elevator descended to ground level. <laughs> there's a lot of life here, and there's a lot to live into in this place. I am a part of this place now. We as a family are a part of this place, and now a part of its history. I'm the pastor of the church next door, Trinity Church, just across the way, which church has been here for 164 years. That's a long time. It was built 10 years before my great-grandparents were married down at Taylor's Creek, just southwest. My paternal grandmother moved here to Savannah uh, from Daisy, Georgia, when she got married. My paternal grandfather and namesake was the chief of police here in the 30s when that job was a political patronage. I grew up on the south side. That is now, of course, Midtown. But I remember with some of you when Abercorn Street ended at Duren Avenue and when the historic district was simply downtown. Before SCAD, before the mall, before CAT, we just had buses then. Not to suggest by any stretch that life was idyllic in Savannah. Anyone with a sense of history knows that is a fallacy. There was also a time, that was also a time before the Civil Rights Act when Jim Crow laws carried the day and the city's racial divide was as obvious as a mailing address. I, I mentioned the church. Uh, and did I mention on Telfair Square since 1848? You probably know that Telfair Square was known as St. James Square when it was established, one of the first four squares laid out by General Oglethorpe at the founding of the colony. In 1883, the square was uh, renamed Telfair Square in honor of the Telfair family and the mansion across the street. You probably know that the old mansion is the Telfair Academy and the Jepson Center where you are sitting is a part of that museum. Trinity Church is situated on the old garden plot of the Telfair Mansion, uh, which was sold to the local Methodists at a fair price in 1848. That's what Tom Kohler told me to do. <laughs> you probably know too, uh, if you've been here for long, you probably know that the Emerald Room, uh, a strip club of some history and reputation, was on this very site. It was torn down in anticipation of the construction of this building. Another building on the northern half of this property housed the first Methodist preachers in the city. Uh, Hope Hull was the second one to come here in about 1785. He lived right here on this lot in the area fronting the square. To say that he was uh, not beloved is an understatement. I know it is hard for any of you to imagine a preacher who might not be universally beloved. 
Uh, at that time, Savannah was residually Anglican and thought of Methodists as dissenters. Hull preached a, a gospel of temperance, and he was also an abolitionist, uh, which made him, uh, which put him at odds uh, with those in charge of the commerce and those in charge of the prevailing moral views at the times. A mob consisting of about half and half his parishioners and local movers and shakers resolved to rid the town of Hope Hall. Uh, not wanting to kill him, which was kind, I suppose, uh, not wanting to kill him, but in an effort to make it clear he was not welcome to be in the city anymore, uh, they resolved to pelt him, not with stones, but with British pennies, which were worthless after the Revolution, and hundreds of bullfrogs, uh, which they had collected from the wetlands for the occasion. Uh, Hull was the first person that we know of uh, to be publicly frogged. <laughs> I'd love to say that we don't do that to people here in Savannah anymore, but we're just a little more subtle. A few years later, about 75 actually, Telfair Square and her environments was occupied by General Sherman and his troops. Uh, the soldiers were bivouacked in the square and the church was used as a hospital for Union soldiers. Thanks to the Corps of Engineers' presence here, that's not the last time a visiting general has trod that brickwork in the square, but Sherman was the last one to do it while exercising his military authority. Uh, the last 150 years or so have uh, seen some other kinds of generals, those whose creative process and passions uh, were fueled by this city, if not specifically Telfair Square. Some others whose life here was anathema to commerce and the prevailing moral view, people like Andrew Bryan and Tunis Campbell and Ralph Mark Gilbert, W.W. Law. Those of you who have been here as long as I have will have your own list. The bottom line is this, life continues unabated. Issues come and go and particular isms are different from decade to decade. But across those years, we've seen a long, slow slog, and that may be redundant. A long, slow slog, dare I say it, upward. It hasn't been, isn't, won't always be fun, but it, that's life. And time flies when we are having fun or not. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pastor.